Part 9 of Acres of Diamonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Acres of Diamonds by Russell H. Conwell. Part 9. 6. Millions of Hearers. That Conwell is not primarily a minister, that he is a minister because he is a sincere Christian, but that he is first of all an Abo Bon Adam, a man who loves his fellow man, becomes more and more apparent as the scope of his life work is recognized. One almost comes to think of his pastorate of a great church as even a minor matter besides the combined importance of his educational work, his lecture work, his hospital work, his work in general as a helper to those who need help. For my own part, I should say that he is like some of the old-time prophets, the strong ones who found a great deal to attend to in addition to the matters of religion. The power, the ruggedness, the physical and mental strength, the positive grandeur of the man, all these are like the general conceptions of the big Old Testament prophets. The suggestion is given only because it is often recurred, and therefore with the feeling that there is something more fanciful than the comparison, and yet, after all, the comparison fails in one important particular, for none of the prophets seems to have had a sense of humor. It is perhaps better and more accurate to describe him as the last of the old school of American philosophers, the last of those sturdy-bodied, high-thinking, achieving men who in the old days did their best to set American humanity on the right path, such men as Emerson, Alcott, Gough, Wendell Phillips, Garrison, Berard Taylor, Beecher, men who Conwell knew and admired in the long ago, and all of whom have long since passed away. And Conwell, in his going up and down the country, inspiring his thousands and thousands, is the survivor of that old-time group who used to travel about, dispensing wit and wisdom and philosophy and courage, to the crowded benches of country lyceums and the chairs of schoolhouses and town halls, or the larger and more pretentious gathering places of the city. Conwell himself is amused to remember that he wanted to talk in public from his boyhood, and that very early he began to yield to his inborn impulse. He laughs when he remembers the variety of country fairs and school commencements and anniversary and even sewing circles where he tried his youthful powers and all for experience alone. In the first few years, except for possibly such a thing as a ham or a jackknife, the first money that he ever received for speaking was, so he remembers with glee, 75 cents, and even that was not for the talk, but for horse hire. But at the same time, there is more than amusement in recalling those experiences, for he knows that they were invaluable to him as training, and for over half a century, he has affectionately remembered John B. Goh, who, in the height of his own power and success, saw resolution and possibilities in the ardent young Hillman, and actually did him the kindness and the honor of introducing him to an audience in one of the Massachusetts towns. And it was really a great kindness and a great honor, from a man who had won his fame to a young man who was just beginning his oratorical career. Conwell's lecturing had been, considering everything, the most important work of his life, for by it he has come into close touch with so many millions, literally millions of people. I asked him once if he had any idea how many he had talked to in the course of his career, and he tried to estimate how many thousands of times he had lectured and the average attendance for each, but destined when he saw that it ran into the millions of hearers. What a marvel in such a fact as that! millions of hearers. I asked the same question of his private secretary and found that no one ever kept any sort of record, but as careful an estimate as could be made gave a conservative result at fully eight million hearers of his lectures, and adding the number to whom he has preached, who have been over five million, there is a total of well over thirteen million who have listened to Russell Conwell's voice. And this staggering total is, if anything, an underestimate. The figuring was done cautiously and was based upon the facts that, as he now addresses an average of 4,500 in his Sunday services, an average would be higher if it were not for his sermons in the vacation time are usually delivered in little churches, when at home, at the temple, 
he addresses three meetings every Sunday, and that he lectures throughout the entire course of each year, including sick nights a year, lecturing during vacation time. What a power is wielded by a man who has held over 13 million people under the spell of his voice. Probably no other man who has ever lived has had such a total of hearers. And the total is steadily mounting, for he is a man who has never known the meaning of rest. I think it is almost certain that Dr. Conwell has never spoken to any one of what, to me, is the finest point of his lecture work, and that is that he still goes gladly and for small fees to the small towns that are never visited by other men of great reputation. He knows that it is the little places, the out-of-way places, the submerged places, that most need the pleasure and a stimulus, and he still goes out, men of well over seventy that he is, to tiny towns in distant states, heedless of the discomforts of traveling, of the poor little hotels that seldom have visitors, of the oftentimes hopeless cooking and the uncleanness, of the hardship and the discomforts of the unventilated and overheated or underheated halls. He does not think of claiming the relaxation earned by a lifetime of labor, or, if he ever does, the thought of the sword of John Ring restores instantly to his fevered earnestness. How he does it, how he can possibly keep up, is one of the greatest marvels of all. I have before me a list of his engagements for the summer weeks of the year 1915, and I shall set it down because it will specifically show far more clearly than the general statements of the kind of work he does. The list is the itinerary of his vacation, vacation lecturing every evening but Sunday, and on Sunday preaching in the town where he happens to be. June 24th, Ackley, Iowa. July 11th, Brookings, South Dakota. 25th, Waterloo, Iowa. 12th, Pipestone, Minnesota. 26th, Decorah, Iowa. 13th, Hawarden, Iowa. 27th, Walken, Iowa. 14th, Canton, South Dakota. 28th, Red Wing, Minnesota. 15th, Cherokee, Iowa. 29th, Red River Falls, Wisconsin. 16th, Pocahontas, Iowa. 30, Northfield, Minnesota. 17, Glidden, Iowa. July 1st, Faribault, Minnesota. 18th, Boone, Iowa. 2nd, Spring Valley, Minnesota. 19th, Dexter, Iowa. 3, Blue Earth, Minnesota. 20, Indianola, Iowa. 4th, Fairmont, Minnesota. 21st, Croydon, Iowa. 5th, Lake Crystal, Minnesota. 22nd, Essex, Iowa. 6th, Redwood Falls. 23rd, Sydney, Minnesota. 24th, Falls City, Nebraska. 7th, Wilmer, Minnesota. 25th, Hiawatha, Kansas. 8th, Dawson, Minnesota. 26th, Frankfort, Kansas. 9th, Redfield, South Dakota. 27th, Greenleaf, Kansas. 10th, Huron, South Dakota. 28th, Osborne, Kansas. July 29th, Stockton, Kansas. August 14th, Honesdale, Pennsylvania. 30th, Phillipsburg, Kansas. 15th, Honesdale, Pennsylvania. 31st, Mankato, Kansas. 16th, Carbondale, Pennsylvania. En route to the next date on. 17th, Montrose, Pennsylvania. Circuit. 18th, Tuckhannock, Pennsylvania. August 3rd, Westfield, Pennsylvania. 19th, Nanticoke, Pennsylvania. 4th, Galston, Pennsylvania. 20th, Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. 5th, Fort Allegheny, Pennsylvania. 21st, Newton, New Jersey. 6th, Wellsville, New York. 22nd, Newton, New Jersey. 7th, Bath, New York. 23rd, Hackettstown, New Jersey. 7th, Bath, New York. 23rd, Hackettstown, New Jersey. 8th, Bath, New York. 24th, New Hope, Pennsylvania. 9th, Penn Yan, New York. 25th, Doylston, Pennsylvania. 10th, Athens, New York. 26th, Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. 11th, Oswego, New York. 27th, Kennett, Pennsylvania. 12th, Patchacue, Long Island, New York. 28th, Oxford, Pennsylvania. 13th, 
Port Jarvis, New York, 28th, Oxford, Pennsylvania, preach on Sunday. And all these hardships, all this traveling and lecture, which would test the endurance of the youngest and strongest, this man of over seventy assumes without receiving a particle of personal gain. For every dollar he makes by it is given away in helping those who need helping. That Dr. Conwell is immensely modest is one of the curious features of his character. He sincerely believes that to write his life would be in the main just to tell what people have done for him. He knows and admits that he works unwearedly, but in profound sincerity he ascribes to success of his plans of those who have seconded and assisted him. It is just the way that he looks upon every phase of his life. When he is reminded of the devotion of his old soldiers, he remembers it only with a sort of pleased wonder that they gave the devotion to him, and quite forgets that they loved him because he was always ready to sacrifice, ease, or risk his own life for them. He depreciates praise. If anyone likes him, the liking need not be shown in words, but in helping along a good work. That his church has succeeded has been because of the devotion of the people. That the university have succeeded is because of the splendid work of the teachers and pupils. That the hospitals have done so much has been because of the noble services of physicians and nurses. To him, as he himself expresses it, realizing that success has come to his plans, it seems as if the realities are but dreams. He is astonished by his own success. He thinks mainly of his own shortcomings. God and man have never been very patient with me. His depression is at times profound when he compares the actual results with what he would like them to be. For always he hopes to have soaring far in advance of achievement, that is, the hitch your chariot to a star idea. His modesty goes hand in hand with kindness and I have seen him let himself be introduced in his own church to his congregation when he is going to deliver a lecture there. Just because a former pupil of the university who is present, Conwell No, is ambitious to say something inside the temple walls. And this seemed to be the only opportunity. I have noticed when he travels that the face of the newsboys brighten as he buys a paper from him that the porter is all happiness, the conductor and brakeman are devotedly anxious to be of age. Everywhere the man wins love. He loves humanity, and humanity responds to the love. He has always won the affection of those who knew him. Bayard Taylor is one of the many. He and Bayard Taylor loved each other for a long acquaintance and fellow experience as worldwide travelers. Back in the years when comparatively few Americans visited the Nile or the Orient or even Europe, when Taylor died, there was a memorial service in Boston at which Conwell was asked to preside, and as he wished for something more than addresses, he went to Longfellow and asked him to write and read a poem for the occasion. Longfellow had not thought of writing anything, and he was too ill to be present at the services. But there was always doing something contagiously inspiring about Russell Conwell when he wishes something to be done. The poet promised he could do what he could. And he wrote and sent the beautiful lines, beginning, Dead he lie among his books, the peace of God was in his books. Many men of letters, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, were present at the service, and Dr. Conwell induced Oliver Wendell Holmes to read the lines, and they were listened to amid profound silence to the fine ending. Conwell, in spite of his widespread hold on millions of people, has never won fame, recognition, or general renown. Compared with many men of minor achievements, this seems like an impossibility, yet it is not an impossibility, but a fact. Great numbers of men of education and culture are entirely ignorant of him and his work in the world. Men these who deem themselves in touch with world affairs and with the ones who make and move the world. It is inexplicable this, except that never was there a man more devoid of the faculty of self-exploitation, self-advertising, than Russell Conwell. Nor is there a mere reading of him. Do his words appeal with anything like the force of the same words uttered by himself? For always with his spoken words is his personality. Those who have heard Russell Conwell or have known him personally recognize the charm of the man and his immense forcefulness. 
but there were many among them, those who control publicity through books and newspaper, who thought they ought to be in the warmest in their enthusiasm, have never felt drawn to hear him, and, if they know him at all, think of him as one who pleases in a simple way the commoner folk, forgetting in their pride that every really great man pleases the common ones, and that simplicity and directness are attributes of real greatness. But Russell Conwell has always won the admiration of the really great, as well as the humbler millions. It is only a supposedly cultured class in between that is not thoroughly acquainted with what he has done. Perhaps, too, this is owing to his having cast in his lot with the city of all cities, which, consciously or unconsciously, looks most closely to family and place of residence as criterions of merit a city in which it is almost impossible for a stranger to become affiliated or a philadelphia -tized, as might be expressed and philadelphia in spite of all that conwell has done has been under the thrall of the fact that he went north of market street that fatal fact understood by all who know philadelphia and that he made no efforts to make friends in rittenhouse square such considerations as seem absurd in this twentieth century but in Philadelphia there are still potent tens of thousands of Philadelphians love him, and he is honored by its greatest men. But there is a class of the pseudo-cultured who do not know him or appreciate him, and it needs also to be understood that outside of his own beloved temple he would prefer to go to a little church or a little hall and to speak to the forgotten people in the hopes of encouraging and inspiring them and filling them with a hopeful glow rather than speak to the rich and comfortable his dearest hope is one of the few who are close to him told me is that no one shall come into his life without being benefited that he does not say this publicly nor does he for a moment believe that such a hope could be fully realized but it is very dear to his heart and no man spurred by such a hope and thus bending all his thoughts toward the poor and hard-working the unsuccessful is in a way to win honor from the scribes for we have scribes now that are quite as much when they were classed with the Pharisees. And it is not the first time in the world history that scribes have failed to give their recognition to one whose work is not among the great and wealthy. That Conwell himself has seldom taken any part whatever in politics except as good citizens standing for good government. That, as he expresses it, he has never held any political office except for he was once on a school committee and he also does not identify himself with the so-called movements that from time to time catch public attention, but aims only to be consistently at the quiet betterment of mankind, may be mentioned as additional reasons why his name and fame have not been steadily blazoned. He knows and will admit that he works hard, and all of his life has worked hard. Things keep turning my ways because I'm on the job, as he whimsically expressed it one day but that is about all so it seems to him and he sincerely believes that his life in itself been without interest that it has been an essentially commonplace life with nothing of the interesting or eventful to tell so frankly surprised that there was even a desire to write about him he really has no idea of how fascinating are the things that he has done his entire life has been of positive interest from a variety of things accomplished and the unexpectedness of which he has accomplished them. Never, for example, was there such an organizer. In fact, organization and leadership have always been as the breath of life to him. As a youth, he organized debating societies, and before the war, a local military company. While on garrison duty in the Civil War, he organized what was believed to have been the first free school for colored children in the South. One day, Minneapolis happened to be spoken of and Conwell happened to remember that he organized, when he was a lawyer in that city, what would become the first YMCA branch there. And he even started a newspaper, and it was a natural that the organizing instinct, as the years advanced, should lead him to greater and greater things, such as his church, with the numerous association form within itself. Therefore, his influence in the university, the organizing of the university, being itself an achievement of positive romance. A life without interest. Why, when I happened to ask one day 
how many presidents he had known since Lincoln, he replied quite casually that he had written the lives of most of them in their own homes, and by this he meant either personally or in collaboration with the American biographer Abbott. The many sideness of Conwell is one of the things that is always fascinating. After you have got the feeling that he is peculiarly a man of today, lecturing on today's possibilities to the people of today, you happen once again some fact that he has attracted the attention of the London Times. Through a lecture on Italian history at Cambridge in England, or that on the evening of the day on which he was admitted to practice in the Supreme Court of the United States, he gave a lecture in Washington on the curriculum of the prophets in ancient Israel. The man's life is a succession of delightful surprises. An odd trait of his character is his love for fire. He could have easily been a veritable fire worshipper instead of an orthodox Christian. He has always loved a blaze, and he says reminiscently, for there is no single thing he was punished so much for as a child as building bonfires. And after securing possession, as he did in the Middle Age, of a house where he was born and of the great acreage around, he had most of the enjoyable times of his life tearing down old buildings that needed to be destroyed and heaping up fallen trees and rubbish and piling in great heaps of wood and setting the great piles ablaze. You see, it is one of those secrets of his strength. He has never lost the capacity for fiery enthusiasm. Always, too, in these later years, he is showing his strength and enthusiasm in a positively noble way. He has for years been a keen sufferer from rheumatism and neuritis, but he has, has never permitted it to interfere with his work or plans. He makes little of his suffering, and when he slowly makes his way bent and twisted downstairs, he does not want to be noticed. I'm all right, he will say, if anyone offers to help, and at such a time comes his nearest approach to impatience. He wants his suffering ignored. Strength has always been to him so precious a belonging, he will not relinquish it while he lives. I'm all right, and he makes himself believe that he is all right, even though the pain becomes so severe as to demand massage. And he will still, even when suffering, talk calmly or write his letters or attend to whatever matters come before him. It is the Spartan boy hiding the pain from the gnawing fox, and he has never let pain interfere with his presence on the pulpit or the platform. He has once in a while gone to a meeting on crutches, and then by the force of will be inspired by what he is about to do, stood there before his audience and congregation, a man full of strength and fire and life. End of part nine.